everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm here with Jakia King. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm really good. And thanks ever so much for having us here at your studio. This My is pleasure, Warren. Pretty fantastic. In a beautiful part of the world, Franklin. Franklin, right. Tennessee, yep. I won't give away the address. Please don't. <laughs> 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 trying, to stay, trying to stay as undercover as possible. Now this, um, you said you got this property, what, three or four years ago? Three and a half years ago, yep. And then it took about a year to renovate. So we, we gutted it, essentially, redid the floors and uh, built walls inside of walls in the, in the portions uh, in this room that we're in now. Um, and then the, on, the, on the first floor, the, across the hall, was a master bedroom suite. Mm -hmm. As the room over there was, uh, it's a little bit smaller now, it was like 20 by 18, uh, 16. And then, um, so built walls inside of walls, turned the bathroom into a vocal booth. Great. Closets and amp locker. You know, in this room, there's... There's still a, on the exterior, there's a window there and a window there. You right. know, on the, I just drew the shades, secured them, yeah. and put a wall up. Nice. Yeah. I noticed that when, I, when, when we arrived, I was like, is this, a, is this the studio? You know, because I saw all the windows yeah. and stuff. That's great. Well, it's a great utilization of the space. We've been here for a few hours and filmed and something else. Please check out the inside of the song of You Somebody, which is freaking fantastic. I like your philosophy in recording. Um, it might not be a philosophy, it just might be the way that you work, but you, you capture performances, number one, but also you print sounds. You print, you really are committed to a sound. Yeah. You're not sort of either A, fixing it on the mix, or more importantly, you're not loading in a whole bunch of plugins to achieve it. No. Um, what was, was it just growing up on records and then finding out how they were made and uh, solidified that for you? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I like to um, I like to think that I do most things in my life with intention, mm -hmm. you know, and I definitely like to be intentional about recording because, um, yeah, I mean, that's the way the records that I grew up listening to were made. Mm -hmm. You know, they had limited resources. Um, they had to be very purposeful about the way they did things. And, yeah, I just want to record the sound as... Um, as I want to hear it in the final product. And because I also find that when you, um, you define a sound and it, and it becomes a fabric of the song and the production as you're building it, it informs the other things you're doing. Absolutely. It helps you make better decisions along the way. So I'd rather just kind of go for something, go for a vibe and commit to it. And because um, the, the amount of times that you really miss the mark mm -hmm. where you have to redo something, uh, top to bottom is pretty rare. Um, or an element, you know, it's like, it's not a big deal. It's just like, okay, do it again. You just make it a little bit better. And that, because the things that you've created around it kind of help keep that space that you want it to exist in anyways. So yeah, I just try to do things with a lot of intention. And um, then there's not a lot of guesswork in the end mm -hmm. about what it's supposed to be Makes and sense. what it's supposed to sound like. It's a secure, um, the mixing job should be about enhancement and presentation and not about decision making. Yep, I agree entirely. Um, plus, you know, the great records that we grew up in were engineered and mixed by the same person. Yeah. You know, the, the, it, it was a phenomenon of the sort of 80s where suddenly they became a mixer. And even then, I think through most of the 80s, it wasn't like every album had an external mixer. It sort of started to develop and stuff. Till the 90s came along and then every album uh, did have an external mixer. Yeah, yeah. It, was, yeah it became kind of uh, a rare occasion that... Uh, the same engineer that recorded it would mix it, yeah. So um, I suppose going back then, so how did you get involved in music? What was the, you know, how did it become a career? Always loved uh, music uh, from the very early age. My mom had a really fantastic record collection, which um, introduced me to a lot of, she loved David Bowie, she had the Beatles, um, the Allman Brothers, um, you know, just uh, McCartney records, uh, Joe Cocker, Dylan. This is all kinds of really, you know, it's all over the place. Really great music. Um, so I spent a, I spent a lot of time digging through her records, and I got um, I got a little forty five uh, record player, uh, very young. I would say probably maybe five years old. Um, and my my first, how old would I have been? Maybe six. Uh, my first records were the Jackson Five, ABC, mm -hmm. and Steve Miller, Fly Like an Eagle. Right. Um, yeah, fantastic productions and recordings. Um, and then soon after that, I, I had a, a cassette recorder, just kind of one of those, I don't know what you call it, but it's like one of those long records in mono. It's got the buttons on the, at, the, at the end. Um, I wanted to be a radio DJ, so I would um, put my mom's records on 
Yeah. And I'd rec- and I'd record them to the cassette deck. I'd just put this cassette deck in the room, and I'd record them and then do little announcements in between. And um, right. so I was just kind of fascinated by it, and I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a drummer. They didn't. They, my parents didn't want. My mom didn't want drums in the house. <laughs> um, didn't want me hitting, beating on drums. So they gave me a guitar, and I just you know I played some guitar when I was young. Uh, when I got to high school, it uh, it really became. I started hanging out with my friends that were in bands. And you know, getting around their PA or their, the four track, those that's the things I started to be interested in. And so, I mean, not really purposefully, but like kind of just recording had been in my life, and music had been really important to me. And then I got to um, uh, the time I was going to college, and I, I uh, didn't want to didn't want to be in college. I dropped out. I was like, okay, well, what is it that I want to do? And um, I just thought about the the Jimi Hendrix records that I love so much because I. I, I I had realized in my teenage years that um, there was something that, you know, like Jimi Hendrix and Eddie Kramer, that they were, they were using the studio as an instrument. Mm-hmm. It was more, it was, it, there's something, there's something different about those particular records um, where there's an element, the, the, the recording process was part of it. It wasn't just, you know, because I, I mean, I love Led Zeppelin. There's a lot of things that I love. I listen to the records and it didn't really occur to me that it was anything more than a performance, mm-hmm. you know. Um, uh, but but the Hendrix records kind of like a little light bulb went off, and so I just decided that uh, when I didn't want to go to college, I was gonna. I saw an ad in the back of Rolling Stone magazine for the recording workshop, and I thought, well, that sounds like a neat idea to f- learn how to make records. So I went to the recording workshop and got a job. You know, well, in which city was that? Uh, the recording workshop is uh, it's in Chillicothe, Ohio. It's a mm-hmm. it's an hour. It's still there. They still they still run the program. It's a great program. It's an hour south of Columbus, and uh, it's a very short program. I was there for six weeks, and you see, you know, I I saw very quickly the amount of information that they're giving you, how much time you have to spend in the studio and in labs and in, and and so forth, that uh, most of the most of the people there weren't going to stick with it, and they didn't they weren't absorbing it, and they weren't really applying themselves. So I, it kind of kind of gave me an early clue that. Well, if this is what I'm going to do, I really have to apply myself. And when I so I finished that, and I went back to I lived in the Washington D.C. area. I grew up in Northern Virginia, and I got a a job at a recording studio studio in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, it's a place called Balance Sound. And um, just kind of, I mean, honestly, I just went from there. We did a lot of commercial stuff during the day, but then in the evening they would book sessions for local musicians. Mm-hmm. And um, as the assistant engineer there, they'd put me on those sessions as the chief engineer, and I just sort of started there. You know, I'd, I'd, punk bands would come in, go-go bands, jazz, whatever. I was just like, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I was just kind of going for it, and it was it was a lot of fun. That's amazing. It's it's uh, interesting. A lot of uh, great guys I know came up doing like jingles and commercials and stuff because very short time to get the job done, which is a really great baptism of fire. You can't second guess. You just have to kind of like quickly try something and put it down. And if you make a mistake, learn from it. And next time, do it better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that year would have been 1987 that mm-hmm. I was working there. Uh, MIDI was kind of a new thing. It was all tape-based. So, you know, you're making uh, voiceover edits and you're doing it on quarter-inch quarter inch tape and you have reels and reels of it and it's just like you know you can record a lot of voiceover in an hour session and then have to edit together and then you need to make duplicate reels you need to make the 15 second spot the 30 second spot and you know edit all this stuff and yeah it's really really makes you focus and concentrate and yeah you you screw up I I remember I I forget um, I forget what the ad was for but I I cut in the wrong dialogue in the 50 second, 15 second ad, and I had thrown all of the outtake tape away out in the dumpster. And so the next day they come back, and I, I had to go through the dumpster and find that piece of tape wow. to, put, <laughs> to put back in there. And uh, yeah, it, just, it was kind of, yeah, baptism by fire for sure. Yeah. Luckily they didn't empty the dumpster. No, in I was very thankful. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't fun being in there looking for it, but I. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. But yeah. So what's the next step from there, from working there? Um, well, you know, uh, I, I spent a year there, and uh, it was a really wonderful year because I, I, I did get to record a lot, of really, a lot of really cool music, but I felt like I need to go somewhere where the music industry is. And um, the studio manager that I had there had recently moved from Northern California, and um, I asked Steve if I could have a little bit of time off to go to 
LA to look for a job. I have family in New York, and I love visiting New York, but it's not, it didn't really feel like that that would be the environment for me where I'd want to live. Um, you know, all I knew about Nashville was it's just country music, and that didn't really appeal to me either. Not that I don't like um, some country music. I like, you know, old, older country music. Um, and, you know, I like some country music now too, but um, that didn't appeal to me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to L.A. So I asked off for a few weeks to go to L.A., um, and, and Steve insisted that I also go to the Bay Area, where he had managed a studio, and, and he introduced me to some people. So I said, okay. I, you know, so at the end of the, end of the trip, I, ta- I said, I, I'll, all right, I'll tack on a few days, and I'll go out there, and I'll look for a job. So I went to L.A., and I did not like L.A. at all. It didn't really, it didn't really jive with me. And I, and I went around for interviews, and I, and, um, I just, uh, I don't know. It just didn't really, just didn't really suit the, the, the kid in me from Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up, uh, I was staying with some friends. They were loaning me their car, like a friend, a friend's, friends of a friend's family. And they were in um, Pasadena. And um, so I would I borrow their car. I was staying with them. I borrow their car and I go on my job search. And after about a few days, I was like, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm, I don't want to live here. So I would just go to Venice Beach and sit and read on the beach all day. Uh, and then go back and tell them <laughs> that I had a great day doing interviews. And then I went up to the Bay Area, and um, I was offered a job at a studio called Different Fur, so um, which um, was started by um, a producer engineer or p- producer musician, I should say, a keyboard player. His name is Pat Gleason. He um, uh, was in Herbie Hancock's band. Oh, fantastic! Uh, yeah, so it was a really cool studio. It, uh, it was a small SSL room, and um, I got a job there, and. Uh, you know, I uh, moved across cross country out to San Francisco in nineteen in August of nineteen eighty eight, and had a job there for a while. I did get fired from that job. Oh, you did? Yeah, How? yeah. Um, uh, we were doing. Um, you know, we did we did a lot of jingle work or and television work. There's a lot of there's also a lot of really cool music. I mean, sometimes we do hip hop from the East Bay. Sometimes we'd uh, Wyndham Hill. Yeah, I remember record, yeah, records, you know, so they, they'd have like a lot of new age and piano yeah. music. Um, so we did all kinds of cool stuff. Michael but, Hedges. Was yes, movie. exactly. Yeah, great guitar player. Exactly. So we were doing a show called Unsolved Mysteries, mm-hmm. and the sessions were really, really long. And uh, it was like two or three in the morning, and I, and I, mis, I mismarked a, uh, the track sheet, and something got erased. Mm. Um, and so the client was very angry about it, and so then I, uh, so I, was, I was let go from my job. For that one mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of unfortunate, and it left a bad taste in my mouth for a little while. Um, and it was very difficult to get a job after that. Um, but, you know, life being what it is, and, and you know, it's like turn lemons into lemonade. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a reason. There's all, you know, it's like you can make. You, it was a good thing in that I wasn't easily able to find another studio job. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to go out and find bands to take into the independent studios uh, right. to, you know, to, to, to make records. Um, I ended up having to do a lot of live sound, mm-hmm. which, you know, I say have to, had to do a lot of live sound. It was a gig. It was like I could go mix sound in a bar or a club for 150 to 100 bucks a night, you know, and, yep. and I'd go on tour with bands. And I, you know, I worked at some great clubs. I worked at Fillmore, the Warfield. I was the production manager at Slim's in San Francisco, which is about... 600 cap room and um, the booking agents there were great. One of the booking agents booked um, like a lot of blues stuff and uh, Americana music, uh, jazz, like really important like music, older artists. I mean, uh, I mean Sun Ra and when Booker T and the MGs had a, re- when they did their reunion, mm-hmm. they played at Slim's and just, you know, Sonny Rollins. There's just so, so much Amazing. music that I never um, was not that familiar with. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so here I am working in a club, either doing monitors or front of house. And then uh, the other agent booked um, all of the, the indie rock up and coming bands, you know, like Blur, mm. you know, or just all, the, all sure. these things, you know, just, just like, so it was just, it was a really incredible place to work because we just had so many, we had sort of legacy, great, curated legacy artists, um, really important stuff. And then we had all the like cool up and coming stuff and, uh, working in the clubs and like learning to do live sound. It was like a huge uh, education. I think it helped in my ability 
to understand what makes a good performance because you know sometimes you'd be mixing sound and it's just like you can't get it to sound good mm -hmm. no matter what you do um uh, and, and then then you and then the next night you got a great band on stage a great artist on stage and it just it's so easy to make it sound mm. great it's like oh there you know it's like it's just more important than my skill set of like where to put the microphone and how to balance things and eq things like performance and uh, there's there's something to t pay attention to um you know it's obvious but when you you know when you're learning to do this you, you all you're thinking about is your skills and what it is you're sure. supposed to do um, and you overthink everything. Um, and so that was kind of a good learning experience. And also, you know, the thing is, is when a band gets on stage and maybe you've had a very brief sound check, um, but the room, the sound of the room changes when all those bodies get in there, you really have a song mm. to make it sound good. And the, 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 you know, the first thing you have to do is you got to make the vocal sound clear mm -hmm. and bring it over whatever the stage volume is and just kind of get that clear on the P and then the bottom end's got to feel good. So like the kick drum and the bass and the vocal, you kind of got to get those things happening really fast. Um, and that's a, it's the same in like making a, a good record, you know? Right. It's like when you're mixing, you know, it's just like, what, what are the most difficult, like the best mixers are really good at vocals and drums and sure. getting the bottom end right. So it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. You, so I learned those skills. I don't know, I'm, I'm just kind of like going on and on and on. No, but, no, this is but, fantastic. But, I did some live stuff, not that much, but a bit. Actually, enough to realize that I prefer the studio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do too. I do too. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great education. It is a fantastic education. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and there was a club that I worked at in San Francisco called Bimbo's Three Sixty Five Club, and it was a it was a Italian supper club that was started in the '30s, um, and so they had a wonderful stage. It was a wonderful environment, and um, uh, in the '90s when I was when I was working there, uh, you know, like big bands were kind of having a resurgence, you know, like Cherry Pop and Daddy's or um, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones or, um, you know, Brian Setzer's orchestra, you know. So we'd have these, you know, we'd have these big 20-piece bands on the stage there and it's like, well, how do you, how do you mic all that and kind of have control of it with a loud PA and loud monitors? You, just, like, you learn a lot about mic placement and, and, um, and just mic positioning and and managing leakage so that you can have a you know you can have a really powerful presentation for the for the PA because you know the thing is in a place like that you don't have you're not in an arena mm -hmm. where this the the sound from the stage doesn't really contribute that much to the sound that you present to the room it's like right. when you're mixing in a small venue you have it's it is truly sound reinforcement oh sure yeah so yeah it's learning all those things yeah uh, I, it, I remember many situations where it was pretty much a vocal and kick drum PA. Exactly. Because the guitar player was so unbelievably loud. Yep. The snare may have been cracking, but you couldn't hear any kick or, or, or vocals or maybe even a bit of bass, yeah. Yeah, you had, well, yeah, in the vocal mic, you had tons of cymbals and mm -hmm. snare drum. You, you, just needed to, you needed to get the kick drum going. Yeah. yeah, I remember those days. But yes, I have to go back and say, yes, I, I do. I remember then going back to the studio and being, oh. <laughs> and the other thing about live, of course, is there's no do-overs. Nope. There so, is not. No do-overs. All right, so then you transition back. It, what happened? You started working with bands that you were mixing live and yeah, recording and, them? Yep. Uh, and so that, that sort of went on for a while. And then um, a band that I was working with, Consolidated, um, uh, they're kind of an industrial kind of hip-hop band. Mm -hmm. The drummer, uh, Philip uh, Steer, and um, another engineer that I knew in town, Craig Sylvie, who uh, now lives in London and um, has done a lot of... Uh, really amazing records, um, uh, they were opening a studio. And I had been working for Dan Alexander at Coast Recorders um, as, as, a, as an intern assistant. And um, I knew that Dan was, he wanted to sell Coast because he was moving down to the gold, old Golden State Recorders downtown and on 2nd and Harrison. And so Coast Recorders was a, a Bill Putnam room that had been built in 1964, to to capture the West Coast jazz sound, mm. and there was a Dan had a like a Neve desk in there, um, and I knew that he wanted to get out of that space, and so I and I knew Craig and Philip were looking for a studio, so I said, um, I know the space. We should go talk to Dan. You guys would probably want to take this over. So they did. They bought the console from Dan, and then I was uh, one of the main engineers at the studio. I helped rewire it and kind of put it together, 
And so that's when I kind of got back to having a studio job finally, like a regular one. I had, I had some, I had a partnership in a, a studio in the East Bay uh, where we mostly did like hip hop and rap records. Um, but, and I loved that. I love that, but it, I love hearing that you did this. This is oh, great. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's where I kind of started with Pro Tools too, is because um, Mark of the Unicorn had a. Um, I wish I could remember the actual name of the, the software, but um, but you could use a sound designer card and do four tracks of digital audio. So I would I would um, sync that to the tape machine uh, and do you know I could fly samples around, fly vocals around, do vocal comps with a computer, and that's sort of how I started with Pro Tools, and this was in the very, very early 90s. Uh, but then sort of go, go back to, to Coast. So we get in there, we change the name to Toast, which Dan didn't like very much. Um, <laughs> but, toast Recorders? <laughs> yeah, well, we just called it Toast. Just, <laughs> just Toast. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, that room was great. We had, you know, a Studer A800, the Neve console, um, a lot of great microphones, and... Um, and that's where I met Eric Valentine. Eric, mm-hmm. Eric uh, was a producer engineer that lived down in the South Bay. And he, he had just done the first um, Smash Mouth record, mm. you know. And then uh, he was working with his band Third Eye Blind. And so he brought Third Eye Blind to do some tracking in Studio A at, at Toast. And that's where he and I, because I was the main engineer in the A room, in the Neve room, uh, I was his assistant for a few weeks, and that's how we became friends. And then he hired me in the few, you know, after that to do some records with him. I had had pro, like I said, well, I had Pro Tools for a long time, so I was someone that had a lot of very traditional uh, skills. My taste leaned towards Neve and Studer, and um, uh, so I had the traditional skills. But then I was also I owned a couple Pro Tools rigs, mm. um, and I was I was uh, I was I was really good at Pro Tools. Uh, so one day, uh, Philip got a call from, uh, Tom Waits a and uh, person cause he was looking for a new engineer for, uh, for the Mule Variations record that he was about to make, um, that had Pro Tools skills, but also new, you know, traditional recording cause you know, Tom comes from, Tom has had a very traditional, like his first few records were like live to two track. Mm. So, um, uh. You know, and he's one of my favorite artists of all time. We did a lot of remixes, and I would engineer and do the Pro Tools stuff for the remixes, and Philip mm-hmm. would produce. Uh, so he got the call saying, hey, would you be interested to do this engineering like for Tom Waits? And he's like, well, it's not me. It's Jakir. You should have, you should connect them. So then Philip called, called me and said, you got to stay by your phone because Tom Waits is going to call you within the hour. And, uh, oh, nice. Yeah, so... Um, so I got that call and I went and met Tom, Tom and Kathleen and uh, did sort of a demo uh, session. Um, what did the demo session being they brought in a lot of musicians that they were considering and, you know, me, the new engineer, um, and we all were baptized by fire. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think myself and two other, the session went absolutely horrible. Oh, it, did. Uh, it did. It was just, <laughs> just a train wreck. I don't remember all the details, <laughs> but we, we had a lot of tech, we had a lot of really technical Difficulties. It was a studio I'd never been at, and things weren't quite quite the way they should be. I guess um, I don't remember all the details. It was I was so nerve wracked by the end of it. Um, so <laughs> I survived, and a couple of the a few other other musicians, and then um, so I got to make that record. So you know, getting getting back getting back in with uh, opening up Toast mm-hmm. and uh, working with Craig and Philip and um, meeting Eric. And, you know, doing the Third Eye Blind record. Um, and then, you know, I also worked on the second Smash Mouth record with, with Eric. Uh, and I was, you know, I was doing a lot of engineering and, and on my own, uh, different things. But uh, and then the Tom Waits gig came along. It's and fantastic. it just sort of, got, it sort of got me back in it, you know, which was very, very cool. And a great artist to sort of inspire you to. Oh, yeah. So where, where from Tom Waits? I made a record with Eric. He sent me to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Because uh, he couldn't start this record, so he called me up and he said, "Look, I've done the pre-production. I need you to go help them f- put, finish putting their studio together because mm-hmm. they, had, you know, they had decided to build their own studio. And basically, when I got there, they hadn't even started. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it was a band called Citizen King. They were signed uh, to a to Hollywood Records, and they had we had a song like the the single was a song called Better Days that did really quite well. So Eric sent me on his behalf for 
uh, like two and a half months to start wow. to start a record, which was really really cool. It's great. Um, but this, I did a few Tom Waits records, and then um, what Tom Waits led to, I mean, it was an amazing experience. I learned so much uh, getting to record with one of my heroes. Um, I learned a lot about performance. I learned about um, being in the moment, uh, how to pair like really beautiful hi-fi sounds with sort of lo-fi sounds, mm -hmm. uh, really make these very interesting um, captures of a performance. I mean, because, he, you know, it's like Tom won't play a song. He won't, he doesn't show it to the musicians. He doesn't like give them a chart or say, <laughs> play the song for them and say, okay, you play it with me. He just starts playing the song. Right. And, um, Very Dylan approach. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's cool. I mean, these great musicians, it keeps them on their toes. They're, they're, they're good enough and they, to, to feel where it's all going, but, right. they, but they don't have any rehearsed parts. It's all off the cuff. And he won't play a song more than, you know, a few times. And it's either happened or it hasn't. Mm. Um, and, you know, he may play a song a couple times on piano and not be feeling it, and then he'll get up and move and go play guitar. Same song, completely different version. Mm. Um, so I learned a lot from that. And then, um, but what I was going to say uh, is that, you know, I got to work with Nora Jones, mm -hmm. you know, because of Tom Waits, because she loved that Mule Variations record so much and, and other things that I'd done. But that's like, you know, it's like, there's a lot of artists that have come to me because of working with him, which right. has been, you know, because he's an artist artist and uh, such a special, special album. Um, uh, Modest Mouse was another, another thing that kind of happened um, uh, around 2000, I guess. Um, I'm, I engineered and mixed the, the good news for people who love bad news mm -hmm. music or, or album. And, yeah. um, you know, the thing is, is like, in our careers, you have to go from assistant engineer to engineer to mixer, producer, and you're, you, um, you're kind of trying to always break these molds. So Tom, Tom Waits uh, kind of took me into that first engineer mixer place, you know, a little bit. But more than, but, but you know, it's just like major labels weren't calling me for my mixing skills because I did a Tom Waits mm -hmm. record. They're, you know, calling me because I was a creative recording engineer. Right. You know? Doing the Modest Mouse record um, was creative recording, but then it, you know it was an indie rock mix. Mm -hmm. It was, and we had a hit song, you know, float on. And so then I got to, so that kind of like solidified a bit of a mixing career. Uh, it makes me think of uh, what Dave Jordan told me. He said that um, labels would call him and hire him because you know he did like Alice in Chains and Offspring, but artists would call him because he did Love Spit Love. Which was the you know the uh, mm -hmm. the, the brothers from uh, Psychedelic Furs and their album was like really super eclectic and interesting but sold like one twentieth of the other albums. Right. But yeah, it is interesting. Like artists gravitate towards artist records. You they know? they do. It's in, and it's important to try to do both in your mm. career. You know, just hopefully for your creative juices and your and, you know the spirit of it. You know, the King stuff we were listening to the other yeah. day yeah. is a bit of both. It's massively commercially successful. But it also happens to be an artist record as well. So yeah. how did you get to them? Um, well, uh, I was spending time in, in uh, working in L.A. for Eric. Um, and uh, I met Ethan Johns. And then we, we came to share a manager, uh, Jim Phelan, who, uh, who, was, who was great. So I, I engineered a couple projects with Ethan, which was cool because, you know, Ethan's kind of a man that does it all. Mm -hmm. um, so to get to engineer with him and for him was really cool as well. Um, and so he had already, before I started working with, with him, he had already done the first Kings of Leon record. So um, I, I, was, I was there on the second record, the AHA Shake Heartbreak record, uh, to be the en engineer. So I recorded it and Ethan and I, we, you know, it was really cool the way we did that record. It was to 16 track. Mm -hmm. um, Ethan had a, like a sort of a makeshift studio in a, an old... Uh, television soundstage in North Hollywood. Uh, so it was like a big, big padded room, giant, like, wow. like 25 foot ceilings, just a big hmm. padded room. Because it was a soundstage meant for television, you know? So it was pretty dead in there. And he had, he had these big baffles made, really, really tall baffles made uh, that were very reflective. So we could kind of like make liver areas in the space. Oh, interesting. Um, so uh, he bought a 3M Type 56, uh, 16-track, uh, 1969. I knew uh, K K 
Kevin Agunas, um, who um, had Sound City for a while, he had a couple uh, Abbey Road TG consoles. And like you do. Couple. Yeah, just like you do. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, so I knew that he had one uh, that he wasn't using. Was, I think it was in storage, actually. And I said, hey, man, you know, I'd love it if I could, we could rent that console from you. So I got that console in there and hooked it up to the tape machine. They're both like 1969, you know, mm. and um, we're all in the room together. And, you know, the band's just out in front of, in front of me. Uh, and we had, you know, we had two tape machines. We had the, the 16 track and a, a Studer, I think it was a quarter inch or half inch. I forget, but it was an A80 and, uh, you know, a handful of mics, Glenn John's mics that he had given Ethan. So, uh, very lovely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, um, also like you do, like you do. <laughs> and so, you know, we recorded, I recorded the Kings of Leon, that second Kings of Leon record to 16 track. Uh, it was, you know, very simple. I had three microphones on the drums. I had uh, one mic on the bass amp. I didn't do a DI. One mic on each guitar cabinet and a vocal mic. Wonderful. And, and they were set up in a circle, Caleb facing the band, and we just recorded that record. And um, I recorded them to seven tracks, and then no track was more than 12 tracks when we were done. And then and the console doesn't have automation, so Ethan and I just sat side by side, and we just manually mix it until we got it, got it right and move on to the next. It was, it was fabulous. So... I wasn't around for the third record. They parted ways with Ethan, and they asked me to come back for uh, for only by the night to be, to produce, engineer, and and uh, and mix the record. So amazing! Yeah, it was it was it, you know so it kind of came about that way. Then, but how did you end up doing it in Nashville? Uh, well, because the band lives lived in Nashville. Oh, they did. They, okay. they, they live in Nashville, and um, they had made the third record um, because of the times in Studio D. Oh, so they'd already worked in there. They'd way. already worked in there, and I had gone and visited them and hung out a little bit while they were making the record. Um, Who did and, they make that with? With Ethan Johns. Oh, with the, oh, yeah, with Ethan. Ethan. And and okay. and and Angelo, of course, he was you know he was present from the first record. He helped them. He helped them with the first record and had you know and was a was sort of a constant all through uh, maybe five or six records. So yeah, we all lived in Nashville, and um, I had worked in Studio D and and loved it and. And they were comfortable in there. I thought they sounded great in there, and it just seemed like a it seemed like a very natural progression, you know. Uh, but, and it's a great it's a it's like a it's a world class studio. It's one of the best studios in the world. That Easily, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, uh, it just made definitely sense. with the best collection of gear in the world. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. <laughs> he has everything. Yes, he does. Times two. Um, so with the, with the so you lived in Nashville at that point. Yeah. Um, so what had brought you to Nashville? My wife. Oh, okay. My wife's from here. I, you know, I grew up in Northern Virginia. I mm -hmm. came. I had some friends of mine that um, uh, that I, you know, grew up with ended up here after school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I came to visit them one Thanksgiving, right. um, and met my wife. Nice. And uh, yeah, and so you know, eventually I made a life to life decision to be here. Right. Um, and uh, you know, it just kind of it just kind of worked out uh, that Nashville has become the place it has. You know, and I'd like to think I had a little bit of something to do with it. You know, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, having the bands like uh, you know Kings of Leon, the Black Keys, and just so many of the other things that have happened here over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. It's a great, and it's also a great writer town. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. you know. So there's just like there's so much more to it. I mean, it's just like I think it's probably one of the. I think it is the best music town in the world right now just in terms of the amount of stuff that goes on here the diversity of what goes on here mm -hmm. and all the people that are here and you know and I'm, I mean I'm friends with you know Vance Powell and Dave Cobb and Ryan Hewitt and mm -hmm. you know and and Reed Shippen and you know and yeah. there's I apologize for anybody that I didn't mention because sure. there's so many there's so many but the, we're all friends here mm -hmm. you know and um yeah, it's really, it's just a great community. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal community. Yeah. So you do the album. Um, when you were working on it, you knew it was going to be special? Uh, yes, but not, not, in, not, in a, not in the way that I'm saying it to be cheeky. Yeah, I thought it was special. I, th I thought, and I, I mean, I truly believed, and I, and I think it's absolutely the truth, that they were one of the best rock bands in the world at the time, you know? Uh, they'd been, you know, they'd been on the road with the Stones and U2. Mm -hmm. I sold them open for U2. You, you know, so before. it's like, yeah. they, like they were getting a real taste of it. They're playing for huge crowds. They mm -hmm. could really turn it on, and um, 
yeah, it's a huge opportunity. You know, it's like I just I knew it was special just because the, I I think they're special. You know, and it was just like it was a real opportunity for me. It was the first time that I'd been, you know, I'd produced before, mm -hmm. but uh, it was the first time I'd been asked to, you know, record, produce, and mix at that, you know, at, at a at a level where I thought there was such an opportunity. Nice. You know, they because they were they were a big band in Europe and the UK, but they're sort of relative. They like if you if you were in the know, you knew about them in the United States, but they sure. they weren't really they weren't really a popular band, and so. There weren't any precedents set, you know, in the American market. And it was just like it's such a huge opportunity uh, to go in there. And we weren't trying to make a commercial record. We weren't trying to do anything of the sort. We were just going in there and just trying to make the most badass record we could. Um, and, uh, yeah, we did. I mean, we, I think we recorded that record in less than six weeks. Um, I started to try to mix it there, and I just wasn't, I just wasn't, finding, my, I wasn't finding my way. So... I took a couple weeks off and then um, mixed it in my basement at my house. You know, nice. On, on my, you know, on on this gear. Yeah. You know, uh, at, at just in my basement in my house. I, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'm in Studio D, the big studio, and um, this is where I should mix it. Right. But uh, I just wasn't finding my way. I, I was doing pretty good, but I, I remember I, um, I'd been mixing uh, a couple songs for a few days, and um, I'm good friends with Richard Dodd and. And I love Richard, yeah. He's amazing. Uh, and he mas he's mastered quite a lot of stuff for me. He mastered Only by the Night. Cool. And I just, uh, I, you know, and his studio is really close there. So I took a couple, I took a couple mixes over there. And um, I was like, man, I just need some perspective. It's like, what is it? It's like, what's it sound like to you? He's, he sounds, it sounds like you're trying to mix it. <laughs> exactly what he would say. Yeah. <laughs> just like you're trying too hard, and yeah. um, so it's like, okay, yeah, you're right. I am. I've, I've like lost. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna just put it down for a minute, and then I was gonna go where I know what I'm doing, and I feel comfortable, and I, I worked it out. Great. Yeah, because yeah, you can go into a new environment mm -hmm. and pull up the tracks and go, oh, these sound pretty good. Because when you when you're in your own in the environment you tracked it, and I know that feeling. I've had done the same thing. Oh, I need to mix it. And I have no perspective because I'm in the same place. But you can divorce yourself from it a little bit, pull it back up and listen to the tones fresh and go, these are pretty good. Yeah. These are good tones. I don't have to <laughs> carve the schnizzle out of everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, I already yeah. did that. You already when, did that. When, when, when I recorded it. Yeah, when yeah. I recorded it, yeah. It's great. Right. So, I mean, that must have just been like, I mean, it was, wasn't it? It was like a kind of a floodgates open. Suddenly there's, there's this band... I remember, yes, they did really well in England. They had tons of gold records and, you know, did hugely well over there. And they were bubbling under over here. Um, but then it just broke mm -hmm. and it was pervasive. It was everywhere. You yeah, know, it was pretty you, massive. Single pretty, after pretty. single after single. Um, what was that like? You're like suddenly a first call. People, you come up in every conversation. Did, did, how do you choose what records to work on when, when you have choice? Uh... Well, just try and do your best. I just try and use, I just try and, you know, I, I you yeah, know, of course you make mistakes, but um, I just, it's always kind of the same. It's like, I, does someone have a unique voice? Mm -hmm. Do I feel like the songs are there? And does this, do, do I feel like that there's an opportunity here for me to really be creative and invested? Mm -hmm. You know, I just don't want to do, I don't want, to, I have chosen sometimes to do things for a paycheck, mm -hmm. you know, or because it seems like a, because the, this, this person's popular already, mm -hmm. and this is well funded, and mm -hmm. this should be, you know, this is at the top level, should be great. Um, yep. And that doesn't, that does not necessarily equal a great result. You right. know, you, you learn, you learn, it's like that you have to still be discerning. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I just tried to kind of get back to the basics of, well, can I, can I really offer something to this? Can I dig in? Does it feel like that the artist is going to dig in? Right. You know, um, how invested are they going to be? Just try and just try and figure those things out and do those things. You know, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. And even you know, the thing is, is like I've it, it, I, I know this is true of all of us. We've made lots of great records that nobody's heard of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it's hard to pick sometimes. Yeah, it was tough for me. I I remember maybe, maybe you can emphasize with this. I remember after the Frey stuff, especially the second record, I got lots of I got some big album projects, but I also got lots of really amazingly talented indie artists that were willing to pay 
like pretty darn good money to make records. So I was able to work continuously. And there's a couple of those records I go back and listen to and be like, these are just as good as the Frey records in every way, shape or form. Sonically, the performances are great. Sometimes it was even better in some ways because I could choose the musicians. Yeah. And I yeah. could choose like incredible players to work on these tracks. But yeah, without the backing behind it, they just fizzle out and go wherever they can go. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a big it was a big change. I mean, uh, you know, I'd heard my songs on the radio before. Um, but it was there for a while. You just, you know, just all over the place. It's just everywhere. It's like out of people's cars. It's in the airport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like you land in a new city and you turn the radio on and there it is. It's like, it was pretty wild. It was very cool. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I loved it. Um, but it's kind of, it kind of, kind of spins your head around a little bit too. Right. You know, um, and, uh, you know, they, there were seven Grammy nominations for that album. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's very, very cool. And to win, you know, and to win Record of the Year is, that's oh, definitely a highlight. And, you know, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, just a little side story is, so the Record of the Year that year was announced by Nora Jones and Ringo Starr. And I had just made Nora's record. I just finished it. And, um, right. It wasn't out yet. So, you know, it's always that thing of like, oh yeah, I'm all, it's, it's an honor to be nominated. You know, right. you know, it's an honor to be nominated. And I realized when I was sitting in the audience and Nora was getting up there to sort of present it, and it's like, well, there's my, there's my friend, there's someone I know, and it's like, wow, she's, you know, she's announcing this category that's like, it's, it's the Grammy category number one. It's record of the year, mm -hmm. and I'm, and I just had this flash of the sinking feeling. It's like, wow, if she doesn't say my name, I'm gonna be really bummed. <laughs> and I, you know, and I, and before that, it was just like, this is just nice to be here. It's nice to be nominated. And it's like, oh wow, somebody I know. It's like if she says somebody else's name, that's gonna feel kind of bad. Um, fortunately, she said, you know, she said Kings of Leon and said my name, so it was cool. Amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Absolutely incredible. Well earned. Incredible record. Oh well, thanks, man. Right. Incredible band. Incredible. It's an incredible time. A lot of, lot of, a lot of things have to go right. Right. You know, but yeah, I'm very, very proud of it. And so should be. Well, and once again, if you haven't watched that inside the song of You Somebody, go check it out. I'm sure there's links flying around here and everywhere. Um, let's do some gear talk. Let's do some gear talk. So tell us about these anthems. I know you were, you were saying off camera that you love these, and I just listened, and they are phenomenal. Um, yeah, they're just, uh, you know, they're kind of hi-fi-ish, hi uh, um, and they're just really flat and honest. Sounding, I, I just find that uh, I, I I can work really fast on them and it, and it translates really well. And I love these towers because these subs, you know, the sub towers are you know are left and right, and and the sound is coming from the same place. The the low frequency information is coming from the same uh, location as all the other information, as opposed to being off in some weird corner or under the mm -hmm. desk or something and feeling disjointed. It just feels uh, very natural and a, very much a part of the sound. Yeah, it's I, just like if you turn the subs off, it's just like, it just sounds like a normal pair of speakers. Mm -hmm. and you turn it back on, it's just like, oh wow, it's just like all oh, this extension, but it doesn't feel like it's coming, you know, right. like I said, it doesn't feel like it's coming from some other place. Um, so yeah, they're, they're just really great. It's, there, it's, a, it's the 218s with the, with the base 25 uh, subwoofer system. They're fantastic. Yeah, the, uh, and then there's these passive radiators on the back yep. of the top ones. Yeah, we just listened, and it was, it's great. Nice. Um, now, just to reiterate, you mixed this album. On yeah, the so KRK's these, are the, these are the latest. This is like Generation 4 of the KRK uh, Rocket 5s. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Only by the Night Use Some, and Only by the Night album Use Somebody uh, was mixed on the Generation 1 of the Rocket 5s. Right. No sub, uh, and that's that's what I use. And I had also a little a little pair of computer JBL speakers that I don't really I don't <laughs> use anymore. I kind of broke them; like they're dead. Um, but that's what I mixed the album on. And I, just, you know, the these Rocket Fives have always made a lot of sense to me. Right. They, you know, they're not a they're not they're not a neutral necessarily neutral sound. Sure. Um, but they uh, they just they have a good low frequency, a lot of clarity, and they've just always made sense to me. So. Right, get yeah. great results. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Ulrich Wild mixes on these as well, doesn't he? I think there's, it's, it's, there's actually, he does. He does. Yeah, 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 yeah he does. Yeah. yeah, there's, there's something, there's something to him. Yeah, and he mixes like, like freaking slamming metal up front, you know. And yeah. So on a little speaker, so yeah. And then the Pro Axe, uh, you know, that's 
I got there's a lot of a lot of people and these are pretty common in Nashville, mm -hmm. um, and so I got used to them and, and I kind of like them. Um, they're they're not as flat and honest as some other speakers, but they're sort of like an upgraded NS10. Right. You know, and so I have a sub on those. Um, so, but I most I mostly use the I mostly use the Amphions. Okay. And uh, I trust that I trust you know the Amphions are just they're just nice to listen to because they're big and they fill the room sure. and it kind of surrounds you. Um, I trust the KRKs because of all the work I've done on them. Right. Uh, you know, and they're nice to have you know work at a low volume and just right in front of you. And I see what you've done here. You've got the the cloud. I think they call it floating yep, over the top. Yeah, yep. It's nice. Um, so you must put some time into the room to design it. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, it's it's kind of a square room, you know, yep. but it's walls inside of walls, and the, there's a lot, really good isolation um, all around. And yep. then uh, Jay Porter at um, Prime Acoustic helped me sort of spec out what I needed in here and kind of helped me with a basic design. I certainly had to adapt it quite a bit, but um, yeah, the the this the the Prime Acoustic tr room treatment is pretty solid. Right. You know, it does it does a great job. It's it's. Uh, it's it just controls things enough. You know, you don't want anything too dead. You right. you want a little bit of you want a little bit of reflection, and uh, yeah. So yeah, you want to enjoy it. Yeah, it did take quite a while to get all this stuff installed. I'll tell you that. It looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're in this area here. Yeah, sure. See a pair of quad eights here. Yep, the four four fours, four band uh, EQ. Um, it's like a late seventies design. Uh, they just they have the thing about quad eights. They have a, a particular the op amp they have in them is an AM10. It just is a really special sounding op amp. And um, you know this this fixed frequency EQ, and you've got you've got uh, two bell patterns, t tight you know, and wider, and then a shelf on the bottom. Um, it's just a really wonderful sounding EQ. And if, if you're reaching for these, what are you typically using them on? Um, uh, these end up getting used on bass guitar a lot. Uh, drums, some, uh, but yeah, we just sort of the bass. Just I don't know. There's just just where the frequencies fall. Um, it, we just end up end up using it a lot for bass, um, guitar once in a while, and um, you know, kick drum, kick drum sometimes as well. And then the then you know uh, the Neve the 1081s. I love 1081s because of the EQ on them. Right. Uh, it's such a flexible EQ. So a lot of kick and snare with these. Um, vocals, uh, not not to use the EQ just because of the the, the mic pre in it, and um, uh, you know anything really. I mean, you can't record a bad sound through there. <laughs> you know, I love it. I love it for kick and snare, uh, electric guitars. And now the distressors are they your Swiss Army knife? You use them for wherever you need them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have three of them. There's two here, and then there's one over there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I use these quite quite a lot. Um, I mean, vocals sometimes, mm -hmm. acoustics, electrics. Uh, I don't compress electrics too much. Definitely always snare drum. Always use one on snare drum. Um, I don't record bass to them, but uh, I love uh, I love a distressor on the bass in the mix. Hmm. Just because you can, because uh, because the attack and release are, are have such a wide range and the so res such a responsive and you know flexible compressor. Uh, I just, I love, because you can really dial it, with the attack and release, you can really dial in a nice bass tone. You can get the control just right, you know, to let enough of the transient through and, and just with the, work with the tempo and the part to get a really, get a really nailed in bass sound. Fantastic. Okay, the Dangerous, what's, um, is that That's your... my monitor ST, that's just the, that's the, you know, that's where the, um, where the monitors are fed from and this is the remote for it. And th th there's also a talkback mic in here. Uh, so that's what we use for the for the communication system for the headphones. And then what is this? It's here? a Universal Audio 2192. It's uh, it's a uh, uh, high resolution stereo converter. Is that where you bounce back into? Is the sure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then, uh, then the Dramatic Audio Obsidian yep. uh, is an SSL. It's like a it's like a high fidelity SSL bus compressor. Um, love that thing. Love that thing. Right. You use that. Uh, this is pr if I'm mixing in the hybrid or with an analog mix bus. This is what I use on the on the mix bus. Great. And then there's the Sontech EQs. You know, tracking. I'll put this on kick or, kick and snare. 
um, sometimes overheads or toms, just you know where you want to be able to to uh, address some very specific frequencies because these are fully parametric. Th this is the predecessor to the GML right. uh, EQ. This is this is the this is the EQ that George started with. Oh, it is the design. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the one. Yeah. I wish I'd known that. That's quite. Yeah. I'm glad I do now. Yeah, I. Um, the, I mean, I see these. The only other place I see this in outside of your studio is in a mastering studio. Yeah. Yeah. So that's nice. Well, the that, mastering ones are detented. De yeah. yeah the, these are recall. these are fully parametric. Yeah. But I, I rarely ever see them. Uh, I'm assuming they're not cheap. <laughs> uh, you know, if you hunt around for them, I bought uh, I bought one for two thousand dollars. Bought one for a thousand dollars. Oh wow! Yeah, so it just depends. That's great. Then there's the twenty two fifty four you were talking about yep. on the mix bus. Twenty two fifty four. It's um, so this one's with been, the mod. <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, modded yeah. so that the the release times uh, are the same as a thirty three six oh nine. Yep. Although there's only one auto setting on this, where a thirty three six oh nine has two auto auto set uh, two auto releases. Right. Um, so this is this. You know, this compressor would have been in an 80 series, um, like an 80, uh, 14, 80, 24, like a uh, series Neve console. Right. Like right. an early 70s design. Fantastic. Um, it's a, that thing is, it's a very, it's a pretty fast attack, pretty aggressive mm -hmm. compressor. So, you know, when I was using this on the, on the use somebody, uh, on, you know, when I would use it as a mixed bus compressor, I'd have it on uh, 1 to 1.5. Oh, okay. You know, so just just a little bit of just a little bit of glue. I wasn't not a lot mm -hmm. of compression. It's just kind of just just touching it a little bit and Great. and kind of gluing it together. And, and then, then some Chandler. Chandler, you, you yeah. know, the TG one is what EMI's sort of they're tr they're kind of doing a take on copying the Fairchild mm -hmm. uh, limiter. Um, so this is a Chandler. This is um, an early one. And and um, I, what's special about this one is that um, I asked Wade. Um, at Chandler uh, to mod this for me. So all the release times on mine, he cut in half. Mm. So um, so it just, all the release times are halved. I don't know what the values are, but I, it just, I like a, I like the option of having a faster release. Right. A release right. time, you know. I understand. Um, and then. And then uh, 2610? Yep. Use, use that a lot for direct recording in here. You know, we just kind of plug stuff in here. It's also... Um, uh, it's nice to, uh, you know, you kind of want a little bit of a tubey pre, because uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's nice uh, to uh, kind of run those, run the, an input a little hot into those tubes. It kind of just has a nice sound to it. It's a great, great preamp, great tube preamp. So, um, but it's it's here mostly for the convenience of plugging into the the right. the instrument. Inputs. Great. And are you writing all of your uh, automation here? I do. I do. I write all the automation here. Oh, that's fantastic. So, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just nice to have it right here, you yep. know, next to my right hand and, and kind of. Yeah, it's a nice design. How much are these? I uh, you know, I don't remember. Don't know. I have to look it's it not, up. It's not very expensive. Because it's kind of, it's a nice size. It is. It and, is. and also feels, how can I put this delicately? Having a huge console of a bunch of, fly, of faders like this just feels like I'm spending a fortune on a big mouse. Yeah. Where this just seems... I can justify this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean. Yeah, totally. And it's better than you know. It's just I don't. I mean, I don't mind this like the single fa like the fader port yeah. thing. Yeah. But you know, sometimes it's like you want to get in here, especially when I'm doing um, rides on uh, effects. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like I kind of want. Sure. I kind of want to be able to push a few things around at once. Yeah. Uh, so it's you know, it's nice to have the multiple multiple faders. And then it also seems just, like a great size. Really it nice. is. It is. And what's cool is this Sterling. You know, this Sterling uh, modular thing. You can you can get it to you where you. You know, they have it so you can mm -hmm. configure where you, you can place these all across here or just right. have it in different locations, so. Yeah, this is actually a really good desk. So it's called Sterling? Uh, yeah, it's a S Sterling. It took a long time to actually find something that was suitable for the space, you know, because it's like there's not a lot of room in here. And, you know, even the way that the, even the, way that the, the, the speaker stands are worked, you know, Danny and I, took, it took us a little while to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, the Amphion is sitting on the base of the, the, the speaker stand so that I can we can cantilever this uh, is this is meant to be on this side yeah so that the weight is actually over the base like if, if the Amphion was to come off of there and this proact was on there it's to tip over they kind of balance the balance right. each other out so nice. it's kind of a trick to get it all in there 
All right, let's go over to the left here. We'll start with a chorus echo. Yeah. Um, love, a, love a good old tape echo. Um, and that thing has been around for a long time. Um, and then it's got a great spring reverb in it too. So that gets, that gets a fair amount of use. I have, um, I have the rack mount version of it as well, the 555. It's not in this room. It's in a different room. Um, but I uh, love having this around just to put a guitar into or a, like, a, like a bullet mic and Beautiful. Just do effects with that. Uh, Rupert Need. Yep. It's a great, great mic prees. Use those for toms and sometimes electric guitar DIs. It, it, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're a little dark sounding. Mm -hmm. So um, they're nice for DIs or like toms where you want to have something that's got a little bit more punch and heft to it. And then, um, yeah, the API prees are. I like the 3124s. Uh, I, 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 we had four of these with the 1608 on the second Frey record, and, and I, I don't know, I thought the pre's sounded great, especially when tracking full live things, just to have some extra pre's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we use those quite a bit. I mean, uh, uh, vocals, gets picked for vocals a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Know? Yeah, it gets picked for vocals. Uh, it's, it's, it's similar to the desk, so it's, you know, it's usually a kind of a close call sometimes, but it, it also depends on the vocalist. And, Right. And, and and what not what mic we're choosing? La two A's. Yeah, that's a that's the Universal Audio uh, reissue. Love that thing. You know, it's like I love having. You know, the thing for me is like compressors are tone boxes. Sure. So you got to have a lot. It's they're not just com, you know they're not just for dynamic control mm -hmm. um, and you know and, and controlling dynamics. They they're t to me they're as um, important as EQ just in terms of like their tone shaping uh, ability. So uh, yeah, I love having that around. Do you do you have any favorites that you use it for? Any favorite situations? Uh, vocals, bass, acoustic guitar. Hmm. Um, it, that's a probably primarily what what it gets used for. Great. Uh, a bit of a distressor. <laughs> <laughs> this the, these these are for my fatso. Ah. Okay, and what they do is they they change where the threshold is because yeah. you know like a fatso is just kind of. Uh, it's got a fixed. It's got a it has a fixed threshold. Yep, like uh, an eleven seventy six. Yeah, where you where you just adjust where you turn you adjust the amount of input. Yep. This you can you can have a lot of input. Yep. And then change where the threshold is, so you can kind of still get the 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 um, the uh, saturation. Yep. Without the compression, you can change that relationship with these. So is this something you had made for you? It's just a, it's a it's like a little thing that um, they gave to me as a as nice. a because it, it it's something that I, I think it's online uh, about how to do the the to make this to make this mod uh, okay. to make the adjustment because there's an input on the back to where they plugged in right. to change it but they uh, they, they gave me that uh, LA three I I personally I'd love to know what you use them I I think this is the best electric. Uh, compressor ever. I love the way it makes. Uh, it's great on electric guitar. Use it on acoustic guitar a lot. Sometimes on vocals. This right. one's a little bit um, uh, bright sounding. Right. Um, so we tend to put it on like electrics and acoustics. It just it gets you that pa pa pa. Yes. It's magic. And I remember when I first moved to LA, like mid '90s, and even even up through early 2000s, you could buy these for a couple hundred bucks. Oh really? People just didn't rate them at all. You know, because they had no variable attack and release like yeah, 1176. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, people started going, yeah, but that was the sound of this record, that record. And then, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I then bought, a Blue Stripe? I, blue Stripe, yep. I bought, I don't know, I've had that a very, very long time. Um, I bought it for $1,400. Um, it used to be, I bought it off a, an engineer in the Bay Area. Um, found it like on a, it wasn't Craigslist, but it was kind of like a, Similar kind of thing, uh, yeah. So I've I don't, I've had that more than twenty years. It's uh, well, more, maybe you back of a newspaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. was what was the one they used to have in LA? There, oh, I can't remember what it was called. Just something the, trader, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, it's it's probably older than Eric. He's only twenty five. <laughs> I was going to ask him, and I suddenly realized no. It was probably, <laughs> it was like mid '90s. I remember you, there was yeah, there's something trader, and you could. I'm sure I picked up microphones there, all oh, kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy to believe that that was a culture <laughs> that we grew this up was, in. This was, you know, just in terms of like the use somebody yeah. thing. Uh, this is the first piece we've come to. This was the vocal compressor uh, for when I originally mixed it in hybrid. 
Oh, wow. So, so the, this is the compressor that I use on Taylor. And what were you compressing on the way in when you were recording? Uh, what was it using? I was using an LA-2A. LA-2A. So it was a TG-2 yep. uh, mic pre yep. um, to an LA-2A and then with a 902 uh, de-esser oh, on, wow. on it. And a hardware de-esser. Yeah. Yeah, well, on the record path, and I also used I also used one uh, in the mixing ch in the in the chain in the mix chain as well. Oh wow! So a couple, yeah, a couple, uh, you know, hardware de-essers, right there. Do you find uh, you use them on anything else other than vocals? You ever put them on? Nope. No? Uh, only if I only if I'm trying to get cymbals out of something. Uh, okay. You know, okay. like if there's too much hi hat in a snare snare, snare track, right? Can, I DS, I'll DS it out. Oh, nice. You know. Yeah. The whole nine series uh, DBX have sort of fizzled out, but there was they had some great stuff. Though. They did, didn't they? Yeah, they did really, really did. They had those really great little gates and everything. Yep, they had some really fantastic stuff. These are these are like I, in my for for me these were the best uh, hardware distress uh, not distress the hardware DSers ever made. Wow, yeah, that's great. I love them, and and. It's good to see a pair of these. I, I think this is the most underrated and most affordable compressors on the market. It, they are. They yeah. are. I mean, uh, Al Schmidt uses them for, I've seen, I saw him, Al using them on vocal. Wow. Yep. And when I visited Al at Capitol, he was mixing some um, uh, Elvis Costello. Yeah. And I was like, what you got on the vocal, Al? And it's, it's a DBX 160. Yeah, $150 on yeah. eBay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it sounded great. I mean, I I tend to like these on, uh, as you can see, this says bass reamp. Uh, yeah. I tend to like them on bass um, and kick and snare. Great. Yeah, I, I I'm a, on, on kick always for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I don't, wonderful. I don't like I said earlier today, or you know uh, earlier, I don't, um, uh, I don't like to compress kick very often. Right. But if I do, that's what I'm going to do it with. Right. Fantastic. And then the fat so we just talked about. Yep. Love that on, you know, that's like great for acoustic guitars, room, room drum room, um, uh, electric guitar, uh, bass even, you know. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, just a wonderful tool. Another distressor. Another distressor. And then this little baby, which I really should just go and buy another one. Oh, so good. Yeah, it's, it's the sidechain thing, isn't it? The yeah. fact that you can... Um, you could, I, I, I may have told this story before, but I was mixing um, uh, uh, Tom Hamilton's bass. I'm sorry for the big name drop, but I remember there was just a point where we'd done the recall, and it was like, I don't want to move this in case you got it no, you're set. Fine. You can touch it. Yeah, it was like maybe it was here, and I'm like, going, the bass doesn't sound quite right. And then we looked at the recall, we're like, yeah, I think it's supposed to be here and then just like that little extra low end <laughs> that came through and it was like oh there, there it is. is yeah totally it's it's just really really smart i think this is so one I mean, of my favorite is, compressors yeah it's like all the old and new world put together isn't it yeah, it is this is one of my favorite compressors yeah we i, I had it sort of on long-term loan with because of jack douglas um and i can't believe i let it go i probably could have got it for pennies you know got a good deal on it and i didn't i'm an idiot yeah this this is probably of all of the kind of rebuilt, reimagined equipment, one of the best things on the market. Between that and like the TG stuff, it's just I, phenomenal. I, I totally agree. Um, and then of course this. Yeah, the Compex. Uh, that's a new one. Uh, that's the you know that's the uh, um, what what's oh yeah a ADR. Um, that thing is just absolutely magic on drums, drum rooms, drum overheads. Um, lately, I've been using it on the, the R88 drum overhead a lot. I've got to ask you, what, what was your learning curve on it? Mine was like, plugged it in, thought this is the most overrated thing ever, and then about four hours in, it's the greatest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I, to me, I'm just, because it's, I, no, I definitely am not going to touch this. It's but very it's just fiddly. like, it's like one of those, like, oh, yeah, oh, no. Ah, <laughs> it's, like, it's very fiddly. I had, a, yeah, I it's, had a little bit of an education. I had someone kind of like show me the ropes. Oh, okay. So I had, you know, I had I had a jump start on it a long time ago. So, um, but I just, yeah, I love it. I, I just, it was in a, it was in a, um, Echo Park in Indiana, and they had one, like an old one, and I'd heard so much about it. Led Zeppelin drum sounds, and I was like, yeah, put it on the rooms. And I'm just like, you know, I'm still getting tones. I'm playing with it. I'm like, this never knows what they're talking about, you know. And <laughs> yeah, and then just suddenly I'm like, don't. 
touch it. I got it to sound good, and I was like, don't touch. Yeah, it's amazing what it does to drums. It's just like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a magic box. I love it. That's kind of that's. I mean, it's so good at that. It's like I don't. I haven't really used it on much other than drums. Right. Right. Uh, actually, though, we did record an acoustic not that long ago through it, and that it, wow. that was really cool because it's so aggressive. Yeah, so aggressive. Yeah, I, I, I don't know much about them. All I all I know is obviously they've been reissued recently, yeah. and that they're total magic. And everybody that everybody I think the got new one. ones the new ones sound better than the old ones. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah. And they didn't lose anything. I mean, there's there's a, that's they're great. They just look fantastic. <laughs> and more retro, the stay level. Yeah, that thing's that thing's genius too. That gets either used on lead vocals or bass. That's just I mean, you can get a you can you can hammer something with like 20, 25 dB of compression and just you don't hear it. That that one's uh that one's special. I love that a lot. Um it it gets it's getting a, like the parachute record we use it on all of Will's voice. Uh the City and Color record I did this last past year. It's all all for Dallas's voice is all through that. Um, it's either you know lately it just seems like for recording vocal it's either the one either one of the retros is what's what the deal is you know which it makes amazing gear okay so the quad eight console yeah now did you say when we first came in this was part of a bigger console yeah when I first got the console it was, okay. it was a forty channel uh, Coronado I have a light out I guess um, forty channel Con Coronado so it was a twenty four bus output board. Um, 40 channels, uh, big center section, and a patch bay. It's like kind of like a 10-foot-long console. Um, I moved out of the studio that I had put it in mm -hmm. and um, uh, kind of put it in storage. And I just I had always kind of had in my mind as, as things were progressing, kind of moving more into the hybrid situation, that I kind of maybe just wanted to rack it up. And then, I, and then sort of thinking about how to, to repurpose it and redesign it, I... Uh, I sort of came up with the idea of like, oh, well, actually, I could make two consoles out of it. Hmm. And then I had a friend, an old friend in San Francisco, JJ, who wanted, he was looking for, a, he was thinking about buying a small API console. I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, it's like, you know, help me do this project and you can have one of the consoles. Uh, so we took a couple of years and got it done. He has since sold the console, uh, but, and it's still in the Bay Area with another person I know. Um, but... Uh, 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 the drummer Michael Urbano owns, owns it now. Uh, but yeah, it was a 40-channel console, and uh, I kept it. It has f uh, four buses. Yep. So it has four bus outputs um, here. So it, it went from 24 bus uh, down to four bus because I made the consoles are identical. So I, w I wanted to come up with a design to make them absolutely identical. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, you know, so four bus console, and then these these master outputs are for the effect sends. So essentially, you know, you, with a little bit of creative routing, you can get eight discrete right. uh, buses. Uh, there's a direct output for each channel. Um, and then the, the, the black and the red uh, are indicate the left and the right. Oh, okay. Okay. And then so, as you can see, when you get to channels 9 and 10, there, it, the, we don't have a fader here. There's just, this is a, a, a pot to adjust... Um, the the amplifier output because these output amps on nine and ten serve as the stereo bus output. Mm. So these are, these are the, the left and right trims to kind of get the stereo output right. amplifiers balanced and, and matched to be really you know because they drift and so you know you just kind right. of and and also depending you know with a fader depending on where it is in the throw. Yeah. Sometimes the left and the right balance changes a little bit. So that okay. that's what these trim pots are. Um, I modified it also so that. Um, that the monitor return uh, uh, can be assigned because it, originally the the monitor return and the main and the main fader were separate. You couldn't mm -hmm. have both. It was a forty. It was a forty channel console, and which meant forty channels to mix. Mm. You couldn't. You couldn't. You could either have the monitor section go to the to the stereo output or the main fader go to the stereo output. You couldn't have both. So I modified it so that both go to the stereo output. So even though it's 16 channels, um, it is a 32 input oh, okay. to, to, to mix. Um, and then, uh, then the EQ section, the 333. Now, a Quad 8 was, um, this console was designed by some of the engineers that used to be, design engineers that used to be at API. So this, 
uh, this EQ is very similar to a, a 550. It has more bands, uh, but it's, you know, it's detented and, um, and 2 dB increments uh, of gain. And then uh, the mic pre, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's got a, a filter set, a phase, and then you can, the insert can be pre or post EQ. And oh, then nice. I changed out all the faders. This used to have a, a VCA automation, tape-based yep. automation. Uh, so I changed those out. These are all just, then they were linear faders. These are now sort of logarithmic PNGs. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really fantastic console. It's got a lot of headroom. This has, um, uh, the power supplies are, uh, there's a dedicated plus and minus power supply. They're 28 mm -hmm. volts. Oh, wow. You know, which is which is a lot because I yeah. think I think an API is 24 and Eve is like 18. Mm -hmm. So this is you know there's a lot more headroom in this console. Great. Um, and so you can really you can really push it and get a lot of really cool stuff out of it. That's fantastic. Are you? But presumably you're using a lot for tracking as well. Yep. Though. Yeah. 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 We more and more. I mean, uh, the last record that we were just well, the last recordings we were doing we we're doing three songs. It's not, uh, not quite an album. <laughs> uh, we pretty much everything was recorded through the desk. Great. You know, so it's, uh, I know, I mean, we have the Neves and the APIs and there's, there's things around, there's choices. Uh, and we always kind of shoot out which is the best uh, pre for the vocal. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more, everything is just like, I don't know, we just seem to be gravitating towards the console. It sounds awesome. Fantastic. I really love it. Okay, got some, lots of toys over here. I'm going to come over here. Well, first of all, what's this on top? It's just an old crappy uh, analog delay. It's, it's very noisy, but it's got a vibe. It's just an Electra. I don't know, analog delay. I, just, I found it in uh, Future Music that used to be in LA. Yeah, I remember Future Music. Yeah, yeah. Um, some fun stuff. I see you have the uh, Shadow Hills here. Mm -hmm. Camera Pre, which is nice for its different output selections. And this is like the level lock from the from the shore, isn't it? Yeah, this is that standard audio's second generation level or it's that thing is super super aggressive kind of limiter uh, distortion maker, uh, and the, the 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 second generation. This is actually a prototype that Ian Ian sent me um, for the the new unit they have out, and um, it's just phenomenal. And and the, and the new units are really quiet. They used to have it used to be kind of noisy, um, which is true to the original, but. Uh, that thing's amazing. And then tell us about these radials here. Uh, those are sort of um, reamp reamp boxes for pedals, so you can um, you know take a recorded signal and have a you have a send and receive, and you can run a run the signal through a pedal, and then there's a blend knob. So I could get like a you know like a uh, a big muff and um, for something that's recorded and reamp it through the big muff, and then sort of blend it in because this sort of this takes the signal from the uh, low impedance to high impedance. And it's like it's like a, a DI and a reamp box you know, all in one. That's fantastic. And do you like mixing with pedals and stuff and just yeah, having some fun? sometimes, yeah, yeah, to, to process sounds, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. And then these, these were, these were what you were describing you were using on the uh, Use Somebody mix, and I know you're very excited about these, so tell us about those. Oh, the, well, the, the originals are like, they're like an AP, APSI or Angus were, were a couple brands that had these, uh, these four-band parametric EQs. They're just like super powerful, and, and there's very little phase shift in them. They're just super powerful and clear sounding. And so... Feel really um, nice. Yeah, the, um, they're a little they're a little fussy because it's so easy to bump the like if you're trying nice. to adjust the frequency. Um, I mean, this is the frequency in the gain. Uh, but uh, this is what I was using uh, as the final stage uh, for the guitar sounds, I, and we do that kind of a lot. Uh, use them on keyboards, guitars, kick and snare. Um, but uh, yeah, super powerful, really fun EQs. SSL EQ and SSL. Uh Dynamic section. Yeah, yeah. yeah they they have the E and the G. We we use them quite often in the E setting. Um, and you have a preference for these? What, what you're using uh, them? Uh, kick, snare, guitar, many many things. You know, just it depends on the style of EQ you want to go for. You know, because yeah. um, I have a lot of fixed frequency EQ. Like if yeah. we're using the desk, it's all fixed frequency EQ, and then so sometimes that's why that's why I have all of these fully parametrics because yeah. they don't have as much character. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a little bit more, they're a little cleaner, a little more precise. They're right. powerful, but they don't have the character that this has. And right. with the fixed frequencies, 
you know, it, it'll only get you so far. Right. You know, we're more and more with uh, in times gone by when we we're recording, mm -hmm. uh, you could kind of work the, 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 the fixed frequency EQs against each other and you right. didn't have as many elements and sure. kind of make it all work out. Now we're, we got so many things that are layering up and we're, sure. we're, we're, we're placing sounds in such smaller mm -hmm. spaces as you really need to have uh, good parametrics around. Um, okay, some great stuff here. It's a couple of BAE things. Oh, this so this is a full blown Neve reissue. That's a no. That's a that's a ten ninety nine. Yeah. Um, it is the same thing as a ten seventy three, but it doesn't have the, the difference between that a ten seventy three and this is that on a ten seventy three you have got um, seventy. The, you've got the different line yeah. settings. This on, this has a fixed line input setting. You oh, can, okay. So that's that's really the only difference. This is a ten seventy three. Oh, I see. Uh, it, it's been repackaged. This was on. This was also on the use somebody vocal ch chain. This was. Oh. This was the vocal EQ for Caleb's voice in the mix. Um, which would have been before the blue stripe. Right. Um, and then these are a pair of 1272s that actually uh, need to be recapped. Um, 1272s were the line amps in the 80 series Neves. Um, and um, it was a kind of a thing for a while to, to turn them into mic pre's. Yeah, uh, so I, I, had a I had quite a few pairs myself. I had three pairs of these at one stage. Pheno though. Phenomenal. It's, it's really good sounding. Uh, I've had them for quite a long time, and they're due for a recap. They, they're not sounding as they should these days, but they're, they're really, really awesome. This is fun. This oh, is some man. of Eric's stuff. Yeah, Eric, the undertone audio, that preamp um, that is... Just amazing what what it'll do because you you can take the transformer in and out and um, it's just so clear and powerful. It's a it's a, a really really wonderful wonderful thing. And I love that he was so smart to put a a, a VU meter on <laughs> on an outboard pre like that. You yeah. Know, so you can kind of get a get a look at what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. That's really really nice. And then we have an Altec. 1567A mixer, a uh, tube mixer. Uh, um, so you've got um, four microphone inputs. Yep. And then uh, this is a line input. And then you have, so you know, you kind of, you make your balance this way. And then this is your output. And then it's got a very simple high and low pass, or high frequency and, and uh, high frequency and low frequency shelf. Great. Um, so, you know, we kind of, what do you find yourself using it on? Room mics. Room mics. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I'll put an NS10 speaker uh, in front of the drums, and I'll run it through that. Right. It's just like if you want, like, if it's something you want, like an old style EQ on, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of an old, just old fashioned sort of uh, very broad uh, tube EQ. That's kind of what we use it for. And then uh, EL500. Yeah, that's. Um, the uh, the doctor it's it's sort of a um, it's I love that mostly on electric guitar it's a really it's sort of it's sort of like the the closest thing I've found to um, the uh, the vintage warmer right. in terms of getting oh, okay. a little bit of compression and grit and then some EQ I love it on electric guitar I don't know what these are what are these those are white EQs um, and they're they're fantastic because they they introduced very little phase shift. They were designed to be um, uh, the EQs for um, like a PA or a speaker mm -hmm. install. Like you would find, like uh, you would find those very common, um, I guess, in the '80s and '90s uh, on room EQ. Room EQ for like a like your far field monitors. Uh, okay. Like if somebody'd come in and shoot the room and kind of equalize the the, sure. the the big big far fields, they do though do a lot of times do them with those. Oh wow! Be, because there's just very little phase shift in them. There's a different bunch of different models. Um, I really love the way those things sound. Uh, they have good transformers and the EQ is very um, very powerful and very little very little phase shift. Like I said, and I saw those on Reverb. And I got the two of them and the rack they were in for like under hundred dollars. Whoa! Yeah. God bless America. Wow. That's so amazing. we throw the. I mean, no, no, it depends. Sometimes they sometimes they sound great on something, and sometimes they're terrible. We just we experiment with them. Uh, hey, for hundred bucks, why not? Yeah, exactly. They're they're super cool EQs. H three thousand. Hey, my old H three thousand. It's not it's not working anymore. Oh, it's a shame. I love mine. It's my, it's all geeked out. I know. 
I know, but I was mostly I mostly used it for the micro pitch shift. So I've got the that's what I use my got, got it in the box now. <laughs> this is what we have. I was permanently set to. Um, okay, so the Burl. Yes, um, mothership. And and is that is that your favorite converters these days? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I like the way the I like the, especially the the way the input sounds uh, with the transformer on their converters. You know, before their conversion. Uh, uh, that's uh, so my the rig has. 32 inputs and outputs, uh, 16, the, the first 16 ins and outs are on the on the mothership, and then I have the Avid I.O. for the second set of 16 mm -hmm. in and out. Um, the reason that I have the Avid I.O. for the second 16 is that if you're going to do hardware inserts, mm -hmm. um, uh, Pro Tools only is really designed to accurately, as accurately as it does, uh, compensate for the for the, mm -hmm. the latency through its own interface. Oh, I see. So it's just very convenient, and also I use the digital ports on it to feed the headphone system. Be oh, okay. So so the headphone system here is uh, digital um, out of the rig into the headphone box, and so it doesn't really become analog until it's at, at the headphones. Oh, okay. So the so what is the headphone system? What do it's you a use? Behringer. Oh, it's right. just a bear. It's, it's a. I don't know the model number, but it's. A, it does the job. It does the job, and right. it's got a lot of headroom. And and having the digital inputs, uh, right out of Pro Tools, makes it just very convenient. We just can you can very easily do all the headphones from Pro Tools, and it and it. Uh, you're not dealing with any analog conversion in and out. Like I used to have a Furman, which was great. Right. But you know, uh, but you're but you you get into uh, you having to use ampli like a amplifier. Right. Uh, stage to get out to, to headphone boxes and it's, right. it's not I understand. A, yeah, no, it's good. Can we check out your live room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The live room. Let's go. <laughs> oh, and let's not walk past a whole bunch of really cool pedals. I have one of these and I absolutely love it, but there's a lot of stuff I don't have. Like, what the heck is this, for instance? Uh, Beatronics. That is, is an that? Octahive. It, it's a uh, it's so like a you know it's an overdrive sort of fuzz pedal with a um, uh, an upper octave. Uh, well, I just that love you can that throw already. you can throw in there. This is kind of the opposite. It's it has low octave. The Walk to Hell, same company, <laughs> uh, Beatronics, and then you know more Beatronic stuff is Great. Royal Jelly, which like um, yeah. I don't know. What else are you interested in? There's so many things here. There's so many cool things here. We could probably uh, spend this is this is a favorite. Oh wow! The Maestro, Param Maestro parametric filter. Right. Um, because the thing is, is like you can set this on this this boost, mm -hmm. and you can pick the you know pick a frequency like we were last using it for kind of like a Nile Rogers type of mm -hmm. kind of a clean sound. Right. And so you know set to about seven seventy, and I've got like almost twenty dB of gain on that. You know, yeah. so it's like very mid range and pokey. Um, oh look. That's that's a favorite too. Yeah, One of the best that. phase shifters ever. Amazing. Lots of radial stuff. I'm sure you're yeah, a big love, fan. Yeah, love the radial stuff. Absolutely, hundred percent. Great. Oh, and the ox. Have you been using the ox? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it it it, it takes the right situation. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's a fantastic tool. I love it. Now it's not right for everybody, but but uh, um, I love using it when we can because it doesn't. It's hard. You can't really combine it with um, uh, like a cabinet, right? Because there's because of the processing that's going on. There's a little bit of latency, yeah. And so you can't you can't run a, a head through that and and use the mic amp sim, uh, cabinet simulation with that with a real cabinet. Right. So like if a player wants to have their cabinet right. and hear that sound and put mics on it, then well then you can't really use that. But if somebody's willing to just go that route, right. Because um, it sounds just like your amp. That's what's so beautiful about it. It has the the, the variable relis, uh, resistant load that it has. Yeah. It makes your amp sound. It, I mean, your amp sounds like your amp. Right. So yeah, I mean, I, I love it when the when the situation's right. Now, speaking of amps, this is a this was a this is a 16 millimeter tube projector or projector that has a tube amp in it. Uh, so I had it converted into a guitar amp. Great. Because it's got octal tubes and it's. Uh, it's got kind of one sound. You just turn the you turn the volume and tone all the way up and just yeah. just do it. <laughs> That's good. That's Beautiful. a very very cool thing. And there's a Martin over here. Yep, sixty four D eighteen. Gorgeous. Now you were telling me earlier about this drum kit. Uh, yeah, this is the this is this is my Gretsch drum kit. It's a nineteen fifty nine round badge. 
Um, this is the drum kit that was used on Use Somebody. Great. Um, and uh, we used a bunch of different drum kits, but like we started with mine. I, you know, it's like I brought my kit in, so and I set it up, and it, be, it just happened that this was the drum kit that we started with, and we started with that song, and so we ended up using that, and also this Acrolyte snare drum uh, was used on several songs, but this is also the this is my Acrolyte snare drum. Uh, this is also the snare that was used on you, somebody. That's wonderful. It's great uh, that you're in Blackbird with the largest collection of drums I've ever seen in my life. You know, yeah, it's pretty yours. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. What, are, what are these? Uh, uh, these? Oh, these, these are some uh, prime acoustic uh, gobos. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. So, you know, they're so, stackable. So you pa use those to baffle off some small amps Sometimes, in the room? Sometimes, you know. Like right. if, uh, you know, there's a, there's a few different places. Like if the, dr the drum kit's just kind of sat here, it's not really yep. set up. If, you know, you put the drum kit here and you put the baffles around it, it's like kind of very tight and dry right. sounding. Um, typically, for most things, you know, put the drums in the middle of the room, no baffles. Mm -hmm. uh, the room is lively, but not, it's controlled. Sure. Um, so it just sort of depends. And these are the uh, Behringer? Yeah, these are the Behringer, uh, the headphone system. I haven't seen these, they look great. Yeah, they work real nice. That's a heck of a tambourine, look at that. Yeah, Aaron <laughs> Sterling, Aaron Sterling gave me that. That's amazing. That is a tambourine, if ever I saw. Yeah, it's 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 not very practical. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun though. It's um, fun. So, uh, presumably, vocal booth and yep. acoustic guitars and exactly. I suppose amp room was was as well. You it can be. It, yeah, it gets used a little, mostly for singing. We mostly do uh, vocals and acoustic in here. Right. Yeah, and so this this you know this was the bathroom for the master bedroom oh, okay originally for the house and so that i sort of repurposed it and turned it into a vocal booth yeah very cool um is this is this your mic locker no this is tambourines there's some percussion and mic yeah. cables and just stuff we keep the microphones out in the garage oh you yeah because just because for space We're, it's kind of a tight you know it's a tight fit in here so right. so yeah I love that Univox. Yeah, it's a, that's a fun bass. Um, it sounds great. Um, it uh, depends on what the part is because the intonation's not the best, and it's, right. about, it's intonated about as good as it's going to get. Right. So, but it's a it's a pretty pretty cool sounding thing. And then just in here, this was the this was the cl the closet for the master <clears throat> bedroom, and just oh. use it as amp isolation pr primarily. Great. You got a couple more amps out here. Glad to see you've got a classic thirty. Yeah, I, I, I do love my PV amps. There's some, there's some great PV there's amps. There's some gems. I mean, yeah. definitely overlooked stuff. Very overlooked. But then you go guys like Joe Barisi, who's yeah. got like hundreds of PV amps. <laughs> and he knows he's got like everything. And remember in the seventies when they used to build like those monster two hundred watt heads? Yeah, yeah. yeah like all of those. <laughs> really insane things. Oh, yeah. That Ampeg, is that a B-18? It is a B-18. Yeah. That's... That came from Hyde Street, uh, Wally Hyder's in, oh, wow. in San Francisco. So it's like a late 50s. I think, I think it's a 59. You track with that a lot? Uh, sometimes. You know, it's kind of off and on. <coughs> it depends. That's a, that's a big sounding bass. Yeah. It's, it's a and beauty, then uh, a the Selma you were talking about that got used on the album quite a lot. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, I definitely know that it's on Sex on Fire. I don't think it's on You Somebody. I think that was uh, Caleb's match list that we used on you, somebody. But uh, yeah, it's uh, and it's also you know the "Let It Go" song of James Bay. Oh right. That's the that's the guitar amp that was used for that. What I love about this amp is when I was like 15 and I'd go up to my local music store, they would have like used amps like this in the window for like practically give it away. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. now they're like completely collectible because because they're sort of one of a kind. They've got so much personality. But when I was a kid, everybody just wanted a Marshall. It yeah. was like, that was it. Yeah, and they look fantastic. It's very good, yeah, it's a 64. Beautiful. I should have just collected them then when they were like 50 <laughs> yeah. bucks. Yeah, I, there was a band that came, a, a band signed a Domino uh, called Archie Bronson Outfit right. that came over. Uh, they're like a psychedelic blues rock band. Uh, they came over and they, they didn't have the cabinet, but they bought, brought one of these heads in a suitcase and I was like, what is that? I was like, Selmer? I was like, my brother played a Selmer saxophone in high school. I had no idea that they yeah. made amps. And yeah. we used it. I was like, I have to have one. Yeah. This is a little vanity case. 
has a my Sony C37A in it. Which Gorgeous. I, I love this guy. Gets used a lot. It's really beautiful. Um, and I like it's got its own vanity case. It does. <laughs> You can check your look in there. Yeah, yeah, make sure. Does this, this mic make me look thin? <laughs> the R88 we were talking about. Oh yeah, good old Weza AEA. Oh yeah, that's a mic. Yeah. Uh, this is, you know this, I mean, this thing is great on so much. They make such good, good mics, so. Oh, yeah. That guy. We just, uh, Butch yeah. Walker had one of these in his room, didn't he? Middle of the room for great. stereo. Great, great overhead. Yeah. Oh yeah, great room mic. It just yeah. can't be beat. Uh, you know, uh, acoustic guitar, piano, it's just wonderful. He was doing his own, I don't know if I'm calling him out before it comes out, but yeah, he was doing, he's doing just like an acoustic vocal record. So he's got one mic on acoustic, one on the vocal, and that's the room. Nice, yeah. perfect. Yeah. That sounds like a good plan. Yeah, yeah like and it. just Wes is just so passionate about Everything, you know. Yes. Oh, yeah. You get him started on mics, you could be there about five hours. You know, Wes, <laughs> speaking of, of him, you know, I was, when I was getting ready to make the Tom Waits record, mm -hmm. the Mule Variations record, I'd been, uh, I'd had an, a, an opportunity to record with, um, with a Coles mic, and I was like, gosh, I really want one of those for the, yeah. for the Waits record. Um, so I found out um, that Wes was the guy to call, and um, so I, Got a hold of him, and um, I, you know I said, hey, you know, Wes, I I, I want to buy one of these mics. He said, well, I don't have any new ones in stock, but and I was like, ah, I have this Tom Waits record. And he's like, tell you what, I'll sell you one of mine. So he uh, he sold me one from his personal collection, which I thought was really really cool. Um, and it, what's neat about it is it's it's an old, it's one of the old SS. Uh, oh wow. S STCs. Yeah. And somewhere on here, the serial number is really low. It's like in the 300s. I don't know. I forget where it is, but I know that it's... So he had re ribboned it, and um, so I've had this for quite That's a long beautiful. time. Yeah. I, I love this, like, old address label. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's amazing. It's probably his own custom-made case. Yeah, it was, it was totally... He did totally did me a solid. It was awesome. Yeah. Oh, he's a great guy. He is. He is. So that's a little fun thing. Um, What's your sort of main go-to vocal mic? Uh, well, the well the C37 that I showed you yep. um, has been used on a couple albums this year. Um, I think that probably the mic that I've used the most and that that was used on Caleb, not on uh, use somebody because we used that 251. 251. Which. which um, after I recorded that first song, I switched off to this SM7, th this very SM7, this is my, S my SM7 that I've had forever. And I probably, I've used this probably the most on... So it's know, like your main vocal tracking mic? Vo vocals, yeah. That's great. And then a mic that I bought a few years ago, which I'll get down, uh, it gets picked from time to time. The, 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 the songs that we were just recording recently with Patrick Droney, mm -hmm. um, he sounded great on an SM7, um, but uh, we ended up, I mean, he sounded great on the SM7, but he, it was kind of a tough, tough decision, but he sounded, but he sounded even a little bit better on this, and this is a, ah, oh, okay, the Flea 47. This nice um, box, Flea. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's like an exact copy of a 47, and it sounds, I mean, uh, uh, I got this from Chad, who's now at Westlake um, Pro. Um, he gave me a bunch of mics to check out, mm -hmm. and so we were at Blackbird. We were working in Studio uh, E at the time, and uh, it's like, all right, well, let's set, these, let's set these mics up and shoot them out, and... Um, we went and got our favorite 47 from the Black uh, the Blackbird uh, collection, and this one sounded better. And I was like, okay, well, I have to have that mic. Wonderful. Yeah. So, been using this a lot lately too. That's fantastic. Jakir, thank you very much. Thank you, Warren. I appreciate it. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, it was. I appreciate it. And it, it, it was wonderful having you here. Great. And you know, Franklin's beautiful. Nashville's amazing fun. And uh, this has been a bit of a highlight of our visit. Thank you. 
So please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Have a marvellous time recording and mixing.